to The Mixtape with Scott. I'm your host, Scott Cunningham, professor of economics at Baylor University. Today, I had the pleasure to introduce you to a friend of mine, Marina Della Guista. Marina is a professor of economics at the University of Turin in Italy. I've known Marina now for a few years. I first learned about her because of an article she wrote um, on stigma and sex work. Uh, and I've always loved it. And it's sort of shaped how I thought. And it was um, over time, I've become closer friends with her. Our conversation today was really interesting, surprised me uh, for some of the twists and turns it took. And I also learned a lot more about Marina's personality that I didn't quite know. And I uh, really enjoyed uh, all the, just her willingness to share so much of her story uh, with us. I, I hope you enjoy this interview, having a chance to, to listen to Marina's story. And of course, as always, I hope that maybe you hear a little bit of yourself in her story. Uh, let's now turn it over to her. Well, it's my pleasure to have a good friend of mine from the profession, uh, Marina Della Guista from the University of Turin. Welcome to the uh, the podcast, Marina. Thank you, Scott. Uh, will you, for the sake of the listener, tell us again your name, how you, because I may have mispronounced it, tell us your name and uh, where you live and a little bit, uh, you know, what your job title is. Yeah, sure. So I am Marina Della Giusta, and uh, I live in Turin now, as of last year, and uh, I am a professor of economics at the University of Turin. Awesome. Well, before we get into your uh, life as an economist, I thought we could just sort of start with, uh, at the very beginning, where did, where did you grow up? So I grew up in Italy, um, not in this region though. So I was uh, born in Genova, which is uh, a little bit further south on the coast. And, uh, and then I uh, moved uh, through different towns, so three different towns with my mom and dad because of my dad's job moving around. Mm. And, uh, and that was interesting. Um, I know Scott, you've been to Italy a few times now and you know different Italian regions are very different from each other. Yeah. So um, so the experience of moving across Italian regions isn't quite the same as moving across US states, but you know, there are significant differences for a kid, you know, uh, growing up and going through. I effectively did uh, the three levels of schooling in Italy. So primary and then we have middle school and then, you know, secondary school I did primary in Genova and middle school in a place called Trieste near the border with Slovenia, which was then still Yugoslavia. Mm. And, uh, and then uh, moved to Padua um, for, for my high school. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. What did your dad do for a living? So he was an academic also, but he's a geologist. And uh, mm. both of my parents are geologists, in fact, uh, but in a kind of very... I guess Italian fashion, though they both held degrees in geology. Uh -huh. uh, she became a high school teacher, and uh, and he became an academic. Where and did he? So, yeah. Where, what school was he at? So he studied in Genoa, and uh, is is a boomer, right? Is that wonderful generation that you know you study geology then in Italy, and you had like all doors open to you at the end. He had offers from Shell, and he had offers to obviously stay on at university. At the time in Italy, doctorates weren't really a thing yet. I think mm -hmm. a very small minority of people, my dad's generation, would have got doctorates. Mm -hmm. um, so they would stay on as research assistants. Um, and because he's, uh, he's, uh, he's a mineralogist, and so he he was working a lot on developing also instruments to, to study um, minerals. He was also a bit his own technician. So he built stuff uh, in order to do his research with. And then, of course, nowadays it's all, you know, so much more, um, I guess, computer driven, his work as well. Uh, and a lot of the machinery has become more standardized. But I think probably he was still in the days where there was a lot of fun to be had in mm -hmm. the field, also with the technical side of things, that, that mm -hmm. sort of building things for recording as well as uh, as well as actually studying the minerals themselves did they meet uh in graduate school your mom and dad they did yes okay. yes and uh yeah and then i guess uh, yeah uh, i mean it's interesting talking to her now um you know she she doesn't you know she doesn't feel like she kind of sacrificed the potential academic career though she was quite gifted as well but i guess the expectations were different and and maybe even 
uh, from her point of view, um, just the fact that um, she would be supporting his career was taken for granted. Uh, there was no real, I don't think they never really had a discussion about that. Um, and uh, and my dad for his generation, again, Italian man, um, you know, uh, born in the 40s, uh, seemed to me pretty amazing uh, at the time and still does to a lot of my friends you know he was the kind of man who would you know who would do the housework who would do cooking who would do cleaning uh, and so it never looked to me particularly unbalanced or rather it looked maybe unbalanced but as a result of um, of maybe just kind of some spontaneous choices I never questioned the arrangement to be honest right. Right. I just grew up in it yeah you had siblings? Did you have any any brothers? No, I'm an only child. Oh, you're an only child. Okay, I am. So okay. and and moving through towns, I also it also meant I spent a lot of time with my parents. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, tightly knit well, trio. <laughs> well, what was one of your most memorable vacations you took? If you think sort of think back. Oh, wow. Well, vacations with my parents were interesting. So we used to visit grandparents a lot because they they weren't they weren't living where we were living. And so we used to spend pretty much half the holidays visiting um, my mom's side of the family at the seaside. And the other half, I was very fortunate. The other half was my dad's side of the family was in the mountains. Um, so, you, um, I mean, on both cases, I remember, you know, we used to do a lot of walking and a lot of seeing, um, you know, interesting things. Uh, but you know, in hindsight, I kind of realized, you know, I have a lot of pictures of me and my parents, and there's a background of rocks. You know, a, a lot of families have got like the sunset. In our case, the sunset is like on the other side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we are like, we've got the rocks behind. So I'm sure they were trying to to pass on this passion to me for, for nature. And I did like nature a lot. I mean, when I was little, for a long time, I thought, you know, I was really... I loved Conrad Lawrence and all his books and I loved Desmond mm. Morris and all his books and I loved all the books about how animals behave and generally um yeah I actually you know for a long time I thought I was going to be some kind of either a zoologist or maybe a biologist and then I became mm. oh, maybe I'm going to be an ethologist to study behavior of animals I mean in the end I ended up studying the behavior of humans so, so it's right. not that far right. but right. Uh, yeah in in high school or you call it secondary school. Um, is that the kind, is it like in England where you have to go ahead and decide early on, you know, what you're going to specialize in if you go to college? No, not well. You do specialize early on in a choice of track, but it's it's very different from, from the British system uh, in that in Italy, you basically had a more academic track, which was, you know, at the time, basically a couple of types of lyceum mm. um, and and then a lot of more vocational technical uh, type schools. And the expectation of, of, I guess, kids of educated parents who were doing well in school was that they would just choose uh, on the academic track. Uh, right. I don't actually even think anybody explained to me what was available uh, in vocational uh, education at all, to be honest. Mm. Um, I mean, schools at the time, middle schools, weren't really offering career advice. It wasn't a thing, but there was just an implicit expectation, you know, um, kids who did well in school, um, whose parents were educated, were going to do the same kind of thing their parents did. Mm. Um, right. and, uh, and yeah, and it was, uh, so, so for me, it was just like, are you going to do a classical, um, lyceum or are you going to do uh, a scientific one? And, uh, and because I guess I liked more, um, you know, uh, a, a mixture of, of things and I wasn't quite sure whether it was going to be more humanities or, or, or more sciences. I went for the scientific one that seemed to still have both uh, uh, and be a safe bet. Yeah. Uh, and that felt natural. Did you enjoy those classes? Um, some of it did, some of it really didn't. And I must say, um, you know, interesting because it would come back when we talk about my own research, but teachers mattered a lot. It was so obvious to me from the start. I had, so in middle school, I had a super inspiring humanities teacher mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a very nice, uh, you know, nothing, nothing kind of, um, you know, earth shattering, but nice person teaching us math and, mm -hmm. uh, and a very inspiring science teacher. And, uh, and actually they were all women, which I never realized was, uh, was at the time for that kind of school, uh, mm -hmm. not, not necessarily all that common. 
Uh, when I went to secondary school uh, then uh, to this theorem, the first uh, math teacher I had was um, a very unpleasant and very misogynist man. Mm. Um, and there were only uh, maybe a third of the class or just under a third of the class were girls and the mm. rest were all boys. Um, and uh, and he was like picking on us, no end. Mm. I mean, he was clearly convinced we we didn't have it in us to to be good at maths, mm. uh, and that impacted us a lot. I mean, I mm. I remember, you know, to be honest, I remember I those who moved down again at that point. Uh, I actually remember being very close to tears a couple of times at the jokes he was throwing at us, but not mm. you know never really showing it because it's like you know I was gonna hold it all in, but. It was it was really hard, and um, mm. and then that changed when we changed. Um, after a couple of years, we changed teacher, and we had a really nice person. Mm. And and then I went, oh okay, well, I like this stuff again, you know. Mm. And so just realizing how I was struggling, you know, I was great at it, and then uh, with a good teacher, and then struggling with a really bad teacher for two years, and then great yeah. at it again, made me think, yeah. oh, my goodness, just just how much. Right. You know, uh, how much of this is, is the teacher, at least for me, you know, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe some people are better able to abstract uh, mm. from who's delivering. Right. Uh, but oh, gosh, you know, I was I was not I was yeah, really yeah. needing yeah. needing to be encouraged. Yeah. Um, and, and the performance was just incredible. And I can, you know, this this research that is out there, you know, um, that that is trying to uh to split the math anxiety from the test anxiety from the math mm. performance itself. Every time I see those graphs, I kind of see myself. Right. And I see, you know, that that's like me plus the math anxiety. I'm down here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm at the bottom of that bar there. Right. And then, you know, and then you take away the math anxiety and I'm like up there. Right. And, and that was right. literally what happened. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's funny. I, it's like, there's, there's thing. there's ways teacher can matter in a negative way. They can be that discouraging. And then they can also withhold encouragement. They could, you know, and they're both, they're both pretty damaging, you know, to not, to not validate the student versus just tear them down. They both kind of have their, both have impacts. And they don't realize how this kind of, it affects you for life, you know, yeah. the choices you make. Um, and, uh, you know, now long uh, you're, you stay with this thing, you know, um, I have to say, I mean, it, it's funny, but these impressions stay so much in your head, you know, I, sometimes I realized when, you know, when I was in graduate school and I started going to the first conferences, and maybe, you know, there would be some people uh, being very aggressive in questioning you or, or questioning other people, but, right. uh, you know, just, just not doing it in a constructive way, in a way right. that the feedback could be taken on board. Yeah. Um, and, and particularly to young women, I used to instinctively think of this person again, you know, from when, back when I was 14, I used mm. to just think of him again. <laughs> it was that scary. Mm. Um, mm. And, uh, and, and, you know, um, and I, and I had this thing when I started going to conferences of just kind of going, I'm not going to freeze here because, you know, when I went to uni then and, and I, you know, I did economics at the University of Venice because we, we lived in Padua by the time I was in secondary school. So when I finished that, that, uh, that scientific lyceum, I enrolled in the economics degree that was then at Venice. Um, so under the old system, I mean, Italy now has a system that is pretty much in line with the Anglo-Saxon system. So there's like, a, you know, three years undergraduate degree and then two years of kind of some kind of master's. And then if, if you want to stay on, you can go to graduate school. Um, but um, the, the, the choices then were different because you really had to commit to, to a subject and do a full four-year uh, course mm. which if you then were interested in doing a dissertation that was kind of closer to trying out research or throwing this kind of sort of pre-doc type work right um then you would stay another year so most people ended up doing four or five years at uni mm. uh, even before then going on to specialize in the masters which were very often abroad at the time and that's that's what i did too yeah um but but then 
again, you know, when I did maths, then uh, I had again the same experience. So first maths exam at uni was with someone who wasn't very friendly mm. and I didn't perform all that well. I passed, but it wasn't great. And uh, and then I met someone who was enrolling in an advanced maths studying chaotic dynamics when I was in the third year. And I just went along, loved the class, asked if I could enroll. And, and I was top of the class there in this course that only took 15 students a year mm -hmm. because nobody could pass it with the madman who'd written his own book. And I'd studied with Leontiev, would you believe? <laughs> so, oh, he yeah. had. He had studied. He, with had, he had studied with Goodwin and Leontiev. Can you believe that? <laughs> I mean, it was just. And That's was exciting. Smart. Wow. I know, right? And he had these stories of Leontiev on his bike and all of that, you know, and it was only 15 <laughs> of us. And he had that. You know, we were like building fractals uh, and, and programming and doing things like that. It's like the 90s, you know, early 90s. And we're doing this. It's like, why are we doing this? We're economists. <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I tried to put some of that. I, I ended up doing this kind of, I asked for, uh, I applied to do a uh, kind of research type of undergraduate dissertation at the time. When is they let you choose between a kind of, kind of compact format or a more, extensive research one and I went for the extensive one and I had really liked development economics so I mm. wanted to do something on human capital mm. and I wanted to work at our you know investment in education and development and this kind of there were all those theories you know stages of growth and 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 you know um, take off models and things yeah. so I was like trying to 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 do this uh, mapping of education levels and see where there would be a tip off point you know where there were where things would then and I was trying to stimulate this stuff and see uh, you know thresholds that would be needed and it was a really strange dissertation I think they were very nice to me I mean I, I think I had a good literature review. The empirical part was a bit bonkers because I was just kind of <laughs> generating my own simulations of what levels of education would be needed for countries to really take off and not like cascade down <laughs> into some sort of weird place. That was in graduate school or call or undergrad? I was I was an undergrad. Yeah. Oh man, that would be. I bet they. I bet that was fun. I bet that was fun for them though to see you be so excited. I, I, I think so. I think it was fun, but I think that most mostly. You know, it was interesting because mostly um, these people were very supportive, but yeah. at the same time, I was mostly left on my own. Um, there was a very distinct uh, system of, uh, I guess, I, I never realized that at the time, right? I mean, actually a lot of our, I mean, all of our staff were male. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at Venice, I, I wasn't taught by a single woman uh, for my entire undergraduate degree. Mm. and most of the top of the class were boys as well there were some girls who were very good but you know most of them were boys mm. and the, the kind of cohort I was in um, some of the girls that were really top were very much into econometrics mm. and so um, and, and and you know they they were all advised to go and study further econometrics in grad school um and then the other people um yeah there was this thing that that graduate school wasn't really for girls we just weren't getting any advice we were like oh you're very good yeah you have some interesting ideas and even though our marks were maybe higher I don't think they were even realizing they were doing it you know this this is I think this was a really interesting case of unconscious bias we mm. just didn't look the part of the grad student right um and so uh, you know, I remember a very good friend of mine who is who's now a researcher at the Bank of Italy was, was you know, was being given advice, you know, go to Pompeo Fabra or go here, go there, you know, uh, that's where we eventually wound up at, at Pompeo Fabra. But he was getting advice and I was kind of going to these meetings asking, you know, if I want to study further, they were like, oh, you know, you could try and apply for a scholarship to specialize a role. Let's see how it goes. And I kind of, I won one. And, and I didn't know where to go and nobody was giving me any advice. Right. Um, so it was really strange. Um, and uh, and I guess on my dad's part as well, to be fair, um, you know, he's a geologist. He had only boys and he was right. sending them all to do PhDs to the States, but it never occurred to him that his daughter, mm. who was scoring top marks, uh, should be given the same advice. You were just invisible to some of them? It was just like I, they I, couldn't... Yeah. I thought yeah it's it's kind of yeah I don't think they saw any 
potential, I'm assuming. I think mm -hmm. potential didn't look like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, um, and so, yeah, it didn't happen. I, I sort of, I got this, I did win a scholarship to go specialist abroad. Uh, my, uh, one of my supervisors was very nice and it was somebody who studied innovation, um, is now, is now actually the chief economist at the uh, Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, mm. in, in Santiago. He was originally from Argentina and he had been teaching for a while at Venice uh, after his grad school. He had done grad school in the UK uh, at Sussex studying innovation and development and that's what he still works on. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so he said, you know, go to the UK um, and I wasn't sure I wanted to do what he did, which is where he was like, yeah, I can give you advice for this particular area, but if you're not quite sure um, he ended up uh, um, recommending going to Reading. That's that's how I ended up in Reading mm. because he knew people there, um, and also because Reading at the time had a really interesting master's program which taught both the whole development side of things, and it mm. was run together with uh, um, uh, with Oxford University. So Sanjay Alai was teaching a development to us in that master's. The School of Agriculture at Reading has some some really good people actually and they were also teaching us mm. and then there were people coming from Sussex like you know Keith Pavitt and 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 really prominent people in innovation mm. uh teaching us and so I also went there to see a bit okay what else is there but again never really getting any sense that um that I had to approach this uh professionally if, if that yeah. makes sense I yeah. was still I was still with this, uh, I suppose, very much Italian of 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 my cohort type uh, gender views, where you've got to be a good girl, and then somebody is going to notice you're really good. Uh, you just have to wait, and it will happen, mm. right? And and one of the things you come to realize when you then go to an international graduate school is how self promoted you have to be, just mm. even to have the courage to go and approach people to talk to them about your interests uh, or to ask them how to forge a career or ask them, you know, which are the steps to be taken. Um, because I'd lived in this, you know, a uh, very naive uh, world where we moved towns. Uh, I never realized my parents were engineering to stick me in the hardest school <laughs> there was in the town. Right. And I was just always doing very well, but nobody ever thought, okay, what shall we do with her? And she's right. doing so well shall we advise or anything it was just like next down another school uh, I, I just you know I went along with doing the best wherever I was yeah and I never yeah. questioned very much I just thought okay somebody's going to tell me what to do next um, right. I didn't have a lot of I guess initiative in me uh, I oh. was lucky I didn't need to have it maybe uh, it's weird that but... you would say you didn't have initiative though because everything you're saying sounds like you would it would require so much fortitude if you're not being given the encouragement and sometimes even discouragement, but you just keep doing it. What, what, what was your skill that you had that made you keep going? Um, I don't know. I think sometimes I think I'm a bit of a nerd. I mean, if I like stuff and I'm into it, I'll just do it. Yeah. So you were really <laughs> interested in economics. I, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I wasn't at the start, right? So I went and enrolled in economics, to be honest, because of all the faculties out there, it looked the most like my my Liceo. It looked like, you know, at the time, a four-year degree would entail lots of maths and stats, uh, and then later on, econometrics, sure. But, um, you know, you had to do history. That was compulsory. You had to do epistemology was compulsory, as mm. well as obviously all the, all the economics was there. But there were all these other things uh, that were there. Uh, yeah. We had to do two foreign languages. I mean, we had a lot of hours spent on a lot of different subjects. Mm. And uh, and to me, economics was a bit, I I'd become a bit political in high school. So I guess I went to it so like, you know, um, I need to understand the tools of capitalism, you know, so I can I can right. dismantle capitalism <laughs> from within type person. I, I was always, I think, right, totally, bit, totally. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I just I go just inside. Want to see. Go inside the enemy and figure out how. Yeah, stuff like works. wreck it from the inside, and then something obviously went awfully wrong, right? <laughs> because <laughs> it's not like academics have that much of an impact on systems, <laughs> but hey. <laughs> uh, right. But I wanted to understand how things worked. You know, it was always the thing is, I guess my my story is, is always been a bit the outsider the outsider mm -hmm. kid in the school because i was always coming from another town and i wasn't speaking uh -huh. the local dialect and dialect in schools was still a thing you know yeah. uh, when i was little um and uh and i was just not from the place i was never i, I had no chance to be cool anyway uh, right. because i just didn't know <laughs> what were the cool things right. and so <laughs> I was always interested, but I wanted to fit in, right? One yeah. of the things I do is is I fit in super well, super quickly everywhere. Mm. I pick up people's accents really quickly. Mm. Um, and, you know, um, my, my family always laughs because they say they can tell which colleague of mine I've had lunch with because I've picked up their regional accent mm. over lunch. Mm. Uh, they can tell if I've had, uh, if my last call has been with someone like you. Right. And then I'm kind of, I'm going to have this. You sound slightly... like you're from Mississippi. If you take Yeah, it's like a slightly Mississippi <laughs> slant when I'm telling off my kids over dinner. <laughs> like... And if I've spoken to my proper British colleagues, I am going to have <laughs> totally affected. That's so you know, great. That, you know, so, <laughs> I don't know I wanted to fit in but at the same time I wanted to figure out how people fit in which yeah. is never you know it's still mm -hmm. my key question about everything even the stuff we studied together Scott is like I want to understand how do people fit with 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 us with a job as strange as being a sex worker how do people mm -hmm. fit in a market that strange um how do people live differently from the way i live because i'm always the one from the outside anyway yeah and yeah. i guess i've developed a set of skills that on the one hand helped me fit in and people would talk to me and that's nice you know i started in development when people were still running around doing tons of interviews you know for my phd i did 250 interviews myself oh my <laughs> like gosh running around with questionnaires in mexico <laughs> asking people questions wow i want to hear about uh, that yeah yeah so so it's that yeah i want to know how stuff works that's yeah. what motivates me and it still does it really yeah. still does i think i'm lucky i'm intrinsically motivated mm. um and that you know lucky and unlucky right the system that system doesn't reward me as quickly as it would if i yeah. guess if i was also extrinsically motivated right. uh if i understood the right to get by more but but I like what I do and I still find it interesting and it's a lot of fun for me and, mm -hmm. and I've still, you know, done okay. So well, wait, so what were you doing in Mexico? This was while you were at the University of Reading? So when I, so in between, um, so I, I, I graduated, I went for this master's at, at Reading and then at Reading, something funny happened because uh, the people I graduated with at Venice, uh, uh, as I mentioned, one is Professor Mario Cimoli, who's, who's now at, uh, at the Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, had started working on a project in Mexico and he was already there. Mm. And, uh, and this was a project of uh, financed by the EU and the Inter-American Development Bank. They were looking, uh, this, is, this is very 90s, yeah? So they're looking at the integration of uh, uh, smaller countries into bigger trading areas, so smaller mm. mid-income developing countries. So that meant that there were Hungary and I think Greece at the time they're studying integrating into the EU uh, on this mm. side of the pond. The other side was Mexico getting into NAFTA. Mm. And they wanted to figure out what would happen to their productive structures, to innovation, but also they were they were worried about you know employment and things like that. Mm. So they had won this Greek project together and they were recruiting, um, they were recruiting researchers for it. So I was finishing my master's. Sanjay Alal was teaching me from, from Oxford. It was a Queen Elizabeth house, but teaching on the master's program at Reading where I was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, Mario Cimoli was, had already moved to Mexico and they both wrote to me, there's this thing, do you want to come along? And I said, well, that sounds great because I think I need to work now. I don't, I don't know how I use this stuff that I've been studying. Right. And they, people, were asking me at Reading if I wanted to stay on because they had scholarships and money for, for grad school then and I said no can we postpone by a year and I want to just go and try and do something because I want to understand if this is for me yeah and so uh, and so I went on this project and and I lived in Mexico for for a bit of of time that year 
um, it was very interesting. We were uh, interviewing people all over the place, different, you know, they, they were looking at different types of industries and some of them were really kind of still craftsmanship and some of them were multinationals. And yeah. it was very nice to talk to people and talk to them about their worries at the time of what would happen. Those were also the years where, where the whole Chapas, the situation was, was quite hot. Uh, mm. And so it's interesting because going back, uh, Mexico was a much safer place to live than it has been since the war on drugs was declared. Ah, right. Um, so it wasn't as 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 uh, as dangerous. I guess I lived on my own in Mexico City, and then I lived with other friends, and it wasn't it wasn't uh, by any means as 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 dangerous as as it had become. It has yeah. become after. Yeah. And uh, and then we traveled all over the country, both for these interviews and and just for uh, you know when we had time to just visit. You were just um, doing qualitative interviews or uh, you were doing a survey for we a, were doing a regular both. people? We were doing both. And what was interesting is then I realized I was actually pretty good at talking to people. So they, yeah. you know, they, they moved me from being the kind of person that analyzed masses of data behind the screen. So to you go talk to people because very mm. often, yeah, very often, basically, I could just sit there and, and get a lot of interest interesting context information around the surveys that that wouldn't happen with the other enumerators yeah yeah yeah, sure so, well you said you got that talent of just blending in but that's kind of a talent of just naturally connecting with people i bet uh some of it maybe or survival skills survival <laughs> skills sure. too yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah your parents move you three times between, yeah between the ages of 10 and 15 you gotta do <laughs> right 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 Right. Um, so, um, so yeah, but it was um, still development. It was still kind of like, yeah, it was like, it was like trade international development kinds of questions that was before yeah. graduate school. That was between, yeah, that was just before, just, just, it was between the master's center and, uh, and, uh, and the PhD, which yeah. is kind of that continuation from, from undergrad where you were doing all those simulations. Yeah. No, it was it was after the masters. So the simulation exactly. was, I mean, but, it was like, but, but you had you were maintaining that interest in development that it's like started I in was. college. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I when you when you finished that work and you go to the PhD program at Reading, were you sort of saying I want to continue to study development type of topics, or did something change? Um, no, I, I did. I did enroll to study development. What happened was that year, while I was in Mexico, I was reading Putnam's book. Um, uh, you know, the bowling alone. The bowling book. alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and the bowling alone is full of examples from Italy, um, uh, which I wasn't sure were actually getting to the bottom of what I felt were the issues with Italy. Again, having traveled different regions and having experienced uh, mm. the whole issue of, you know, fitting in and informal versus formal networks and institutions and all of that. Oh. Uh, but also it wasn't fitting with, with the story I was seeing in Mexico. And, and so um, you, you probably know, you know, the, the basic contention in that book was very much that there were different civic traditions in Italy um, that that uh, were formed uh, probably, um, you know, around the time of, uh, of you know, uh, the from the Middle Ages on, really. Right. Um, and that had stuck uh, into people's attitudes towards the state and towards each other across mm. the different Italian regions. And Italy having been unified relatively recently, you know, so just you know, from kind of 80, 80, 60, then it meant that a lot of the regional differences that were observable also in civic attitudes, uh, in civic cohesion, in trust uh, in government uh, and trust between citizens and, and, you know, the prevalence of formal or informal arrangements. And then, of course, legal or illegal arrangements mm -hmm. uh, was, was, was a product of that uh, differentiated regional history that was formed, you know, Two three hundred years before, basically, that was his main argument, and and this idea that you know that um, that there was this amoral familism that wasn't that was Banfield's definition from the nineteen fifties. It wasn't Putnam's. Putnam just just obviously you know um, worked elaborated around it. And I remember at the time I went and tried to read reviews of the book as well, and I remember the Italian. Uh, economic historians and historians were furious because they over Putnam's book. It was, 
Oh, they were. I mean, they they felt there was a lot of, you know, uh, willful misreading of other historical oh. events that weren't fitting with the main narrative. And right. Uh, right. I mean, I guess, you know, I, I, I wouldn't ever get into a fight between historians. <laughs> <laughs> it looks even bloodier than amongst us economists, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you right. don't want to go with that. Right. Uh, but, uh, but I remember, you know, it seemed I thought, well, that's interesting. I like a controversy around the story, but also, but also, what was interesting was having just been in Mexico and having and being an Italian who was then kind of moving to live in the UK, and my way of going around things being very different from the typical average British student I was hanging out with, I was thinking, okay, you know, there must be something here in the way people forge trust and and mm. uh, and the way people use this social capital and these connections in able to do things that we are missing out from the development story, from the story of what forms of capital people need. Because mm. at the time, in the 90s, the story was still very much about, well, you need your human capital and, of course, you need your health, you know, but basically it was all a story about human capital and all those complements to human capital. Yeah. Capital, yeah. Right. Uh, health being considered pretty much a complement to human capital. Right, that right, was right. it. Right. Um, so, and, and you know, you had these basic needs frameworks, right? Paul Stratin and and you know, how are we going to measure, um, you know, the human development index? What what should we stick in? You know, it was about yeah. calories, nutrition. It was about education. It was about access to sanitation or or services. You know, right. that was very much a. Uh, it was almost like, you know, you need to educate people, you need to make sure they're healthy, give them gear, and then it's going to happen. And and what was fascinating was this story of what do their connections do for them that mm. I really liked, because, again, it felt very close to home, right? I was somebody who always had to move from one place to another, rebuild the connections, didn't have right. the connections, and knew what it felt like not having the connections, you know, with all my human capital and my gear, couldn't do much, you know, couldn't get around without the connections, could I? Mm. So... And that seemed to be the story as well from all those interviews I was doing in the project in Mexico. You know, people were worried about the integration uh, into these big free trade areas oh, because they yeah. saw the opportunities, but they were like, what if it's going to break up all these networks uh, of solidarity we have amongst local producers here? Yeah? Mm, they were we saying each that, other's yeah, back. there was a lot of anxiety about that in those yes, surveys. Yeah. As well. I mean, there were, yeah. you know, of course, in the press, what went through was worries about correctly the price yeah, yeah. of maize, maybe, or, you know, what would be what it would be like for Mexican uh, farmer producers against, uh, you know, big farmers from the US. But, but yeah. really, you know, for a lot of producers of other sectors, the worry was, and also, will we be wiped out in our uniqueness? Yeah. Um, in, in what we do, will we just be standardized into the, the, the things that are required in order to sell to a big market? Yeah. And uh, and I thought, okay, so, so people here, you know, people clearly also like the connection element uh, of also of their business, the fact yeah. that they are together in a network of other producers and yeah. and they were worried about effectively the disruption of their social connections, mm -hmm. so business, but social connections as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so that was the question really. And so when, when Reading offered me the scholarship and, and said, you know, okay, will you come this year? I went, yeah, I'll come. And the other time what you did was, um, was you had to prepare a research proposal and, and say what you wanted to work on. And, and so I went, okay, I, I want to work on social capital and development. I want to understand it better. Yeah. And uh, and the sort of this issue of the formal and informal institutions, but also the trust. And uh, and I... In a primarily I, development context or was it just more general? Uh, so initially it was just general. Yeah. Uh, so I started out again. It like my undergraduate dissertation just in my own little world i'll be the model of everything you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, and then let's narrow it down to like one question that's <laughs> you know? yeah, that's why i guess you know i guess that's why i always have a lot of time for my graduate students at the beginning yeah. of the journey right. um you know i i like the ones that come with these huge things <laughs> yeah. like okay let's let's try it and make this something you can earn a living from <laughs> <laughs> because you know <laughs> the field has gotten harder to get into let's face it so you need to, you need to make sure you put bread on the table with this mate oh, God. at some point uh, so 
but but yeah so i was like okay because I, in my mind i was like you know i want to build a story that explains what really happened in italy yeah. but yeah. also um so uh, so i wanted to explain everything yeah uh, yeah. but but also i wanted a story about how do we measure this stuff right <laughs> i'm an yeah. economist i was like i want to measure this thing right um so if, if we can measure it we can detect it we can do something with it uh, but also, how do we convince economists that this stuff matters? Because mm. and this was the time when it was primarily, it was James Coleman, it was sociologists working right. on this. So it was right. really, you know, Glenn Lurie's work, pioneering work on this. But then it was so educational sociologists working on this. Yeah. And yeah. then there's some people at the World Bank, you know, Collier was already working on it and Grutart mm -hmm. was working on it and they published books on this social capital development. But it became... You know, it became an exercise in going into surveys and finding, you know, measures of trust and you trust others, you trust who do you trust for what, but but it wasn't, there wasn't anything tangible that people were setting against that. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to find a problem where you could kind of give this thing a value. And because a lot of the friends I had from Mexico from the two years were you prior sort of right get, now. Real quick, were you, were you sort of getting uh, some sort of advice from an advisor they were like you need to make sure. this interesting to economists or something um so i had two advisors one who wasn't very interested at all uh -huh. and uh and one who was and 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 you know still is uh, a, a brilliant i think mind uh mark Carson at reading and yeah. of course is is you know is uh, the theory of the entrepreneur you know everyone knows mark for that Mm. And and he's worked, of course, on social connections very much in the entrepreneurship context. That's mm. never really been into development, mm. but he was, uh, you know, he's 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 got a great mind, and so it was always, you know, he came on as a second supervisor, but very quickly became the only person I was really discussing ideas with. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he was, uh, I guess, encouraging me to. <laughs> he kept saying, Marina. You know, if there's a line and all economists are here, you're out there. You need to talk to them. <laughs> you need to go one inch over <laughs> every day. Yes, I kind of. Can you just come over here? What you're saying is super interesting, but can you just come uh, over here because otherwise we have a problem. How did you and take so, that? How do you? How did that feel when he would say that? Um, I I kind of, you know, I'm funny that way. On the one hand, um. I was thinking, um, you know, I, I get I get this thing of I'm either really doing my own thing and super convinced this is like the the answer everybody's been waiting for, yeah. and the next second I'm into imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah. Full yeah. on. Right. There's nothing in between. Right. And um, and still these days uh, I have to pace myself in the way I take the feedback uh, from from on any work that I do that I, that I have to just step back and not just kind of willingly completely destroy it the second somebody says it's no good then I start like jumping on my own sandcastle <laughs> yeah right, to right. flatten it for them even before oh yeah um, yep. uh, or alternatively go no, don't touch it <laughs> it's like this is mine <laughs> <laughs> I totally get that I totally yeah. get that and, and and kind of so finding that happy place between I don't know I mean maybe now I'm like uh, I still have what 20 years before I retire maybe, maybe I'm getting there yeah um, um but, but it's um it's it's very difficult when you're when you're building a story mostly in your own head um yeah. and, and and you spend a lot of hours on it right it's it's something you never do later on because well I mean later on you have a family you don't do any thinking for a certain <laughs> amount of the day you're just like, right. like in kind of you know firefight mode uh, <laughs> so 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 getting your brain back onto ideas right um uh you you just kind of you're you're building your little creature and so nowadays for example i i worked a lot on my own at the start you see i don't mm. do that anymore because i don't think it's good for me yeah um i, I think I, i'm i'm really i'm not a sole author person uh mm -hmm. i shouldn't have been left to be by the way mm. especially at the start of my career that was criminal how could um, you tell what's the what, what what looking back is the signs that you're not a solo author person 
Um, so I think, uh, I think because uh, um, at heart I'm a problem solver um, mm -hmm. and I need someone to generate problems Mm. with my solutions <laughs> right see? right so right. i'll home in on a problem i can see it's a problem i can see it's big yeah. and i'm really interested and mm. i start thinking of yeah i think and i have a hunch pretty early on that that's that's kind of a way that would maybe work to solve it this mm. is exactly where i need to be with someone else mm -hmm. not yeah. because they need to tell me that's rubbish. This other thing is much better, but they need to start telling me what are the sub problems in my solution. Right. That is where I am at my most creative. I see. I see. So sometimes you don't see those problems yourself, but others will see it. And then it kind of invigorates you to go solve it. That creative yeah. thing. When did you first notice that? Who were you working with when that came alive? Uh, I don't know when I noticed that. I think it's more as in reflection afterwards so, so yeah. a few years back when i started being involved in, in mentoring and teaching grad students not not economics but how to be an economist right right that um led me to try and go back into how i that i got where i was mm -hmm. um and um you know, because I'd spent so many years thinking, I'd made so many silly, uninformed choices. Uh, uh, I'd written so many bad papers because I hadn't been really knowing how to write a good paper for yeah. so long. Yeah. And I was not understanding the importance of networks in this job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I was like acting as if I was like a scientist of the 18th century. I have yeah. a passion for this. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. I'm gonna get into it. Yeah, there's a lot of hidden. <laughs> there's a yeah. lot of there's a lot yeah. of hidden. It's stuff. like, what the hell am I doing? You know, yeah. uh, I needed a proper grad school. I needed right. to understand which conferences you should go to, which not to go to. Yeah, and the also, hidden you know, syllabus. There's a there's a hidden goodness. syllabus. Yeah. Yes, yes. So no, and and you know, this is this you know. When we were conversing about your amazing causal inference work, the fact that you got in there and said, you know, I want to give these tools to people who are not in the top 20s. Yeah. Because people in the top 20s get this. They get it. And, and right. everyone else doesn't. Right. <laughs> and, right. you know, we want to open those doors and we want to yeah. do it for the good of the discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, uh, and just so for that creativity in can, can really, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I then became conscious of, of, you know, I was always super self-critical, you know, I have this long list of, oh, I went wrong there because I did this. I went mm -hmm. right and because of that. And I had to suddenly, because it was supposed to be empowering and it was supposed to help grad students and it was supposed to be part of the mentoring. Yeah. I was like, okay, here are the things I would do differently now mm -hmm. um, rather than, oh, this was all wrong or, right. you know. Um, and 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 that led me to do a lot of rethinking over a, you know about yeah eight to ten years ago over a, over a couple of years and then I think two or three years ago I finally had a, a better understanding of how I got to where I got mm -hmm. um, and and rather than thinking along the lines of you know like a good Italian girl brought up with Catholic guilt right so I was like you know instead of going what is my fault <laughs> what is not my fault yeah it's like you know uh -huh. how long can you just go hitting yourself yeah. um I was just like okay what what went wrong there um yeah. and uh and uh and okay so so what would have helped you know, um, was I needing a support network there? Was I needing uh, better feedback? Uh, you know, I realized, mm. for example, this thing that there's a lot of good literature about nowadays uh, on the fact that women, one of the disadvantages women are at in, in very male-dominated professions, which ours still is, <laughs> but mm. used to be much more so when we started, mm -hmm. um, is the fact that we don't get a lot of feedback, actually, not at all. You know, so, so, you know, we get negative feedback, fine. But actually, if you're a bit of a nerd and a weirdo like me, you you maybe cry in a corner for a day, but then you're still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it doesn't, but the point is you learn nothing from it, right? Right. Because right. it's just you're self-chastised for a day and then you go away, but they, they, did, they didn't give you anything to go on with. So yeah. one of the things, for example, I try and teach in, in my classes to grad students is, okay, 
take all the feedback that comes eh? and then uh, and make a note of it. Even if it's delivered in the most awful manner, ignore it because you know what? This is a problem the deliverer has. Mm. It's not your problem. You know, people who deliver feedback badly, whether unconstructively, aggressively, uncomprehensively, mm -hmm. anxiously, self-validatingly, that's their thing that's coming that's across with thing. the feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so a lot of the work has to be, you take it all, and then, you know, it's a bit like a Oaxaca decomposition, really. Right. <laughs> you just, yeah, stick the weights on the stuff and try and, and clean like, it yeah, progressively. Right. Till yeah. you isolate the pure information you want yeah. to have on that piece of work that you yeah, presented because yeah. some of the information you're going to get is about how they feel about you and frankly yeah. that's irrelevant. and that's irrelevant yes because yeah. you want to know what can you do with this paper to make right. it better right right right, and, right. And, yeah and you know i mean i i say the same thing to my to people too it's like um the goal is extract as much information uh from a critic um, and ignore the noise, which sounds easy because, you know, we all have oh. our own, you know, struggles. And when people are saying negative, critical things about us, we, we, we don't necessarily always, it's not easy for some people to, to extract the signal. They might extract Absolutely. the noise. You know, they might no, no, say, is, I'm a bad person. I'm not, I'm not is, good as, I'm not in a real economist. But, as but opposed this is, this to is a lot of the research I do on unconscious bias uh, is exactly saying that. Mm. So one of the problems of being stereotyped negatively by people mm. is that it hijacks cognitive resources from the brain. Mm. And instead of pushing them in the task at hand, which in this case is receiving feedback, it puts them into defending yourself. Right. It, it kind of blocks out the aggression, but by yeah. that it blocks out also the signal. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, you know, that that's the real issue with stereotyping people. It reduces, mm -hmm. we know, it reduces self-confidence, effort, yeah. productivity. And why? Because the brain has precious little cognitive resources. Yeah. And if half of them are going to be spent worrying about, you know, the way I'm being threatened, yeah. then, you know, then the brain can't do anything else. This but it's going seems back like to the, the maths anxiety, right? <laughs> it seems like the policy recommendation is oftentimes to change a person, make them stop stereotyping. But really, we're all price takers when it comes to other people. And so the work that is needed is to go, these are just words. This isn't real. This is, you know, I have dignity i i have value right now some of what they're saying ha, you know at least 10 percent of what they're saying is probably useful and you know you can decide whether or not you want to learn that 10 percent from this person obviously you know maybe it's just like not worth it but you know um the goal is why would you ever want to throw away information that's what i always sort of think is like you know if there's signal in the message and it's very noisy, right? It, it may be that at that time in your life, you just can't extract the signal because it is just too traumatizing, it is too negative. But the, but the ambition is that you could become able to just ride that and not be able to be so triggered, you know? Because that's a really valuable yeah. skill yeah. in general no, I, I think... is to handle your own inner distress. I think I think on, there's just two things that I, I'd like to to say to that because I think what you're saying is is so important and and at the same time you know um, there is that what you personally do when these things happen and I do give a lot of advice also on just trying to just if it gets too aggressive just to say can you stop there because yeah. I'm, I'm I'm not sure I'm hearing what you're saying right. And try to repeat back to them the one thing you think seemed useful or what they were saying yeah. and ask them if they can clarify it, which in any case interrupts them, mm -hmm. makes yeah. them maybe, you know, typically when you interrupt people, they scale down a little, refocus. Right. Um, you know, some people don't, some people get more aggressive, but yeah. um, 
the other thing is, and we've had this conversation just very recently at the Royal Economic Society mm. about the kind of culture of economics we want to encourage, including at seminars and including at conferences. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the current chair has some very interesting ideas about encouraging chairs at the conference to take responsibility for the meetings they're chairing in terms of making sure these things don't happen. And they're ready with a strategy of supporting the speaker, interrupting people who are, you know, and, and just kind of re reframing things so that the atmosphere stays collegiate and, yeah. the, and the criticism is delivered in a constructive rather than destructive manner. But it is delivered because the other thing you don't want, as you said, is, is you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, with this stereotyping thing that that's fascinated me so much in the last few years, because you know we study inequality, that you you end up at some point, you know, trying to decompose bits again, and mm. and this unconscious part is very interesting. When you start studying it, of course, not only we are all at the receiving end, we're all at the giving end, because yeah. the stereotyping is 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 a thing that the brain does, and it will always do. You know, it's a bit like Marina without glasses will never see Scott, and with the glasses she always will. So mm -hmm. the point is, we need to understand that there are some features, inner features of generating expectations that, that come unconsciously, which bring stereotyping, mm. um, that are just how we function. And the more we accept that and understand that, the more we start to learn ways to counter the effects of stereotyping. Yeah. Right. And, and ways to make that less of a... a um, yeah, I guess less of a discriminating because that's what it is factor yeah. in our interactions with others, both at the giving and at the receiving end. Yeah, yeah. Because you actually, you know, when somebody is stereotyping you violently, of course it feels awful, but ultimately it means they have no direct information on you. And all they can do is project this whole barrage of ideas they might have about, you know, middle-aged Italian women wearing round glasses must all be like, yeah? Uh -huh. And you're just kind of needing to say, okay, actually, this one's Marina. Would you like to know her? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's where um, that's where having techniques is important, and mm. there are tons of really useful techniques from from psychology, you know, uh, uh, that that can be deployed. And I've been, you know, I've been trying to give graduate students advice in that respect. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I think hopefully we are coming to cohorts that are more and more expecting uh, more mutual respect. Yeah. The environment has got. Um, so hard and actually so much harder that I think people are beginning to also look out for each other a mm -hmm. bit more. Um, and also I I just think, um, I think there's going to be a generation of graduate students coming to us in the coming years who've been so badly affected by COVID anyway, that we are not gonna be able to just uh, pretend that our profession uh, no, can't allow itself to be soft uh, um, and uh, you know that unless you're delivering criticism in a particular manner you're not delivering criticism mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's going to have to be some collective rethink uh, in, in those cohorts you know I, I think really from my age up uh, um, I've seen it less and less uh, in, in the younger people I mean some of them still do it but I've seen it less and less uh, but but you know that that really unless criticism is delivered constructively, then it means you are not able to communicate effectively. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> you know? right, right. I think yeah. I think the need to be good communicators uh, is become more of an issue for economists, uh, and, mm. and more economists are aware mm. that that this is an issue. I don't think it was a valued skill at all when we were in graduate school. Yeah, I mean. I mean, some of the instructors I got, they were great, but you know, you right. didn't understand the word they were saying, literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, so it was clear that they hadn't been told, you know, you have to go in there to talk to these kids, and you need to make sure they understand you. They understand you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we do, the goal, right? Yeah, I guess like this is where people have to decide what their goals are. You know, what is your goal? Is your goal to tear a person down? Is it to grandstand? You know, or is is it to is it to, well, what would you say the goal is, you know, of I delivering? The goal is to bring anyone who's got a passion and some talent for economics 
to do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And take away the world economic and take any, any world in. That's mm -hmm. what we should be doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if we are in, in any shape or form involved in educating the next generations in our fields, whatever those fields are, we should be looking out for interest and talent and nurture it. And if we yeah. can't do it, then we shouldn't be educators. Then right. it's not our job. Yeah. It's fine. You know, not everyone likes to do this. Yeah. Um, and it's okay, but but I think, and I think there is more. There are more institutions now that will not accept that kind of scholar that you know shuns students. Mm -hmm. um, they they they. I think there's there's much less acceptance of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. I see it denounced publicly as a behavior we don't want. And ten years ago, Scott, who did that? Yeah, sure. You know, sure. It, it, it actually, if you said this something like that happened to you, you would expose a weakness. Mm -hmm. Amin and I never said it when it happened to me. Mm -hmm. Ever, ever. I was always, always hiding it, even when I was reduced to tears at conferences. Mm -hmm. I always, always hid it. I mm -hmm. never said it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Um, and I don't think that's that's. Um, I mean, I've seen um, seminars with graduate students uh, um, where somebody has got a bit more aggressive, and the others have started clamoring and rumoring in the back about it. You know, there, there's 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 a different culture there. Uh, maybe yeah. I'm over optimistic, but I think, right. I think there is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I. I, I am encouraged by your optimism. That's uh, I, I I am gonna I'm gonna try to be hopeful myself. I've witnessed uh, some pretty pretty antagonistic speech uh, in the profession myself, and it's it's uh, challenging um, for sure. Well, Marina, it is so not. We didn't even get to talk about. Um, maybe we'll maybe we can do it again on another podcast and talk about your work on gender and sex work. Um, Absolutely. but what everything we spoke about was just so wonderful. It's, it's so nice to, to always talk to you and, um, and I, I really appreciate hearing your, your story like this. Likewise, Scott, it was really good to talk and uh, yeah, I mean, whenever you want, we actually get to talk about research. Next yeah, time. that's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll talk okay. to you later. Yeah. Talk later. Bye. Gotta see you soon.